Blog Talk Radio. abound around the world, from strange lights in the night sky to ghostly apparitions passing from one realm to the next, from the great pyramids of Egypt to what lies beneath the depths of Loch Ness, from Bigfoot to Atlantis, they are all mysteries waiting to be solved. Join Laurie Phillips, Lauren Smith, Graz, and Billy Simmons as they search for the truth on Nightcaller's Radio. December 4th, 2014, and you are listening to Night Callers Bigfoot Radio. I'm Laurie Phillips, and I'm here with the Night Callers crew, Lauren Smith, Billy Simmons, and Grass. Tonight, we are having a call-in show. If you've had a Sasquatch experience, we urge you to call in. The number is 347-989-0313. So, uh, it's... Feel free to call in anybody uh, at any time tonight. We've also got some sounds uh, uploaded to play, and uh, we apologize. Our guest, Art Catino, is ill with laryngitis and unable to do the show tonight. So we're winging it. And Mm -hmm. uh, I'll let you all know that it's going to be a very interesting show. You're going to be hearing a lot more from Billy and Grass tonight. (laughs) <laughs> they said they were bringing it on. So uh, <laughs> you, you told us you told us you were going to take the shackles off, and we could you know step the forward into the light. Are off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. well, just paraphrasing. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have to remind them now. It is PG thirteen. The show. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's a suggestion. That's a suggestion. That's not the rule. Now, now, PG could mean a whole different thing in another language. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> We're going worldwide with this. We could have all kinds of fun and still be PG if it's in another language. That's true. <laughs> you know, if, if you'd have changed the rating to R, you know, Graz and I could have, you know, I don't know, broadcasted, you know, in a new tonight or something. I don't know. Uh, as compared to when? Yeah, well, that's true too. <laughs> We're going to have a good show. It, it's it's going to all be good tonight. We're going to rock oh, yeah. on. We'll get some callers in. We're going to have a great show. It's not our first rodeo, actually. In the four years that Mike Powers has been on the air, there's been several times that guests have been unable to come on at the last minute, and we would just do a, a round table or a, a call-in show and. It worked out just great. We we were really surprised how many people called in and uh, told their about their experiences and everything like that. So uh, we we already have some callers. Um, do you want me to uh, uh, see if they want to go ahead and share their story? No, grandmother's on here too. Nobody said anything about grandmother. She's in the background. Oh, place. hello, yeah, grandmother. That's right. Oh, I'm here. I'm listening. 
Hey, grandmother. Well, don't be afraid to chime in if anything pops up. All righty. <laughs> grandmother hangs out with us. <laughs> She's one of our one of our dearest friends, and so we asked her to call in tonight. And welcome to Night Callers, grandmother. Oh, Glad to have nice you here. To yeah, it's wonderful to be here. So um, let me let me take this first caller. Okay. Three oh one, you're on the air. Hey, it's Kenny. Hey, it's Kenny. Kenny. <laughs> Another one of our friends and compadres. <laughs> How you doing tonight, Kenny? <laughs> good, good. How are y'all? <laughs> fine. Uh, we're doing fine. Hey, Kenny, guess what? Billy what? and Grass are are got um, as they have thrown down the gauntlet, and they are going to beat themselves on this show tonight. Are you ready for that? That's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, Billy <laughs> just dropped out. He's going to have to call back in. Uh, I think that's him calling back in. He's got a he's got a low signal tonight. Okay. So he might be popping in and out. Here he is. Here you <laughs> are, Bill. Welcome back, Bill. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see who this other caller is. One moment. Seven four zero. You're on the air. Yeah. Hi. This is Laurie, and I was calling in um, to just share a story with you. Sure, Laurie. Awesome. Thank you for calling in for my caller. Yes. Oh, no you're problem. I'm sorry. You're awful brave. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's called it's called foolish. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay, um this this happened back in 2008 in the fall. And um I believe in Bigfoot, okay? Always have. My dad took me to see <laughs> The Legend of Boggy Creek. Scared the bejesus yeah. out of me. Classic. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah, thanks dad for the nightmares. Um <laughs> but uh what happened was I uh, was with, my daughter was with me. She's about 14 years old at the time. And uh, I'm from Ohio, by the way. And so we were drive. We were just driving on a fall day and driving down the road. And where I was at, the road I was at, like at the end, it's sort of more rural. rural and then as you drive farther in, it gets a little bit more suburban. And so the houses are kind of like far apart. And there they have like a acreage, and there's woods in the back. And so I'm driving, and off to the right, my daughter goes, "Mom, what's that?" Off to the Right, and I'm like, I don't know. I looked, I looked over, and at first, because there, there was a knoll, whatever was running at us was at a knoll, was coming over a knoll. So all I could see was the head, okay, and it was probably about a hundred yards away. And I thought the first thing I thought was, this is kind of rural. Everybody out there has like a cat, like a, like a cow, uh, like a horse, you know, a goat, you know, a pig. So I'm thinking maybe somebody's horse got loose because there was, there was hair blown in like a mane. And I thought, oh, my God, somebody's horse got loose, you know, and I started to slow down. And it was really coming, and I thought, boy, it's coming at a good clip, so I better slow down. I slowed down even farther, and it still was coming. I was like, well, you know what, I better put my car in park because the last thing I need to do is I want to see somebody chasing their horse, and I don't want to hit anybody or hit the livestock or the pet. So... It starts to get closer, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's not running like a horse. I was like, hmm. So then it started to get closer, and I was like, well, maybe, maybe it's an Afghan dog because the hair was long, kind of long. And I thought, maybe that's what it is. So then it started coming closer, and within like 30 yards, I was like, wait a minute, that is not a damn dog. So... It got towards somebody's house. There was like, uh, it was in between a house. And I was like, what the hell is that? And my daughter was like, what is that? I'm like, Octavia, I have no idea. And so we were, um, so it went in front of the person, this house's garage. And I thought, well, good, it's going to go, it's not going to come in front of us. It's going to go ahead and turn and it's going to keep on going and we can just go on our way. Because I had no idea what it was because I was like, I couldn't really get a good look at it. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what, I couldn't make any sense of it. So then it stops right in front of the garage. 
and it stops, and it looks right at it. So I'm like, oh, no, uh-oh. And my heart started to pound, and I, I was like, oh, boy. Next thing I know, it comes flying down over the hill. And uh, my daughter starts screaming, Mom, what is that? What is it? What is it? What is it? And she's screaming. I mean, she is flipping out. And I'm still, like, not registering what it is because I'm, like, looking. I'm looking at, like, what, what is this? And so it's still running on us now. It's running towards my daughter's side. Now, it's not towards the door. It's in front of us, but it's on my, my daughter's side of the car, okay? So it's running down towards my, the, my side of my daughter's car, uh, my, the car on my daughter's side. And she is flipping. I mean, it's to the point where I was afraid she was going to jump out of the car and run, so I literally almost tackled her in the car to keep her from, like, you know, because she was bouncing around the car and screaming. And I was holding her down, like, holding her. I had my arms around her um, her, uh, her um, chest. And I was holding her, and I was in my seat. And uh, she was screaming. So it runs in front of us. And, I mean, when it ran in front of us, it didn't even look at us. I mean, it, it was on all fours, and it didn't even look at us. But when it ran in front of us, I was like, wait a minute. That's got feet. And those are hands. And I was like, wait a minute. And I was like sitting there like my heart was like almost out of my chest. And it was so close. I mean, so, 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 so close that I, it, it could have, it if it wanted to, it could have reached up and ripped off my windshield wipers. <clears throat> or it could, you know, it could have punched its fist through the window. And I was sitting in a, um, a Dodge Caravan, okay? And um, it was so close that the only, like, the, the hair that was hanging down was only off the arms and the legs. The rest of it was real short, and it was all black. And um, you know how, like, you have, like, a, a dog that has, like, um, curly but coarse hair, and you get it cut, like, shaved down for the summer? Yeah. That's how it, the the fur looked on this animal. And it was a Bigfoot, and I, I just, I couldn't believe what I was saying. And, I mean, I was terrified because it, when it went in front of us, it almost felt like, and this is going to seem silly, but it almost felt like, uh, you know when you watch those movies and everything goes, like, real slow? It was sort of yeah. like that. But I know it was fast, but it seemed like that. And then when it ran, it ran off to the left and towards the woods. And I, went, I looked out of the corner of my eye, like, I don't want to use my peripheral vision to look out of the corner of my eye to make sure it was gone, and I left. I was like, uh-uh, I'm not even, you know. We, I waited for like 10 minutes to get my daughter calmed down. But then I took off, and I was like, oh, oh no, 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 no. So that's, and I, I, I really feel that it was um, a, a juvenile. So that was my encounter. I was going to well, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful story. Kenny and Grandmother, if you guys want to jump in and ask questions, please feel free. Um, I was going to ask, what time of day or night was this? This was during the day. This is like mid-afternoon. And wow. Yeah, it was, it, was day, that, that, it was daylight. I mean, that's the, and that's what really kind of threw me because I was sort of like, well, who the hell, oh, excuse me, who the heck? It's CG-13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heck, <laughs> it was like who the heck sees a Bigfoot during the day? Because to me, <laughs> the only thing I knew was they were out at night, and you know that to me it just didn't make any sense. You know, so and then when I when I saw uh, the feet in the hands, I was like, uh, "Are you kidding me?" You know, and I didn't look at his face because I I, I couldn't get my eyes off its feet and its hands. And it was so close that I could see, like, when it ran, it had, like, its hands, of course, were, like, I don't they were, like, folded under, like. And you could see the bottom half of the palm of their hand, of his hand. And I could see, like, the, 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 uh, the creases, the lines in the hands. I mean, it was really close. I mean, it was up close and personal. Now, how, this is how, a chance for me to ask well, you a couple of questions. Mm-hmm. I've... I've Talked to other people about this before. Mm-hmm. Now they got really wide shoulders and a thin waist. Yes. And some have tried to imagine how a Bigfoot runs on all fours 
Oh, and I've tried to imagine it almost like a frog, where the knees come up next to the body. Right, exactly. On either side. Uh huh. Almost like a frog is able to bring its knees all the way up next to its body and hop. Right. Um, did it do alternate left foot, right foot, or was it actually kind of hopping almost? I think, it, you know what, from what I can remember, it was more like, it was more like hopping because I think it was more like, uh, like pushing off its back legs, but mo like using its front uh, hands to like push off, you know what I mean, like to... Uh, keep going, you know what I mean? Like to so all four pulling pretty much itself at the same along. time, or rear and then front, and then rear and then front. It, yeah, it was like rear front, rear front, rear front, and that's sort. And its head didn't bob, and it had it also had hair on the back of its like it, it would look like a mane, like. And so, and that's why I thought it was a horse at first because the wind was blowing, and I thought, oh. Fuck. You know, somebody's horse, but then, yeah, and that's, and its head was not bobbing when it was running. And I was like, uh, yeah, that doesn't look right. Yeah, but it was like feet, hands, feet, hands, feet, hands. That's what I saw. Yeah, people have tried to imagine how they could get that that low, flat-backed almost, mm -hmm. and move straight across the ground, the body not necessarily moving, but the legs doing the work. Exactly. Where the knees come mm -hmm. up, how do they fold mm -hmm. the knees up all the way to be able to get the feet under the body to be able to hop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or run, you know, alternate left, right, left, right? Uh, because it's happened so fast for most people, they, they haven't really been able to tell how it, mm -hmm. how they're doing it. And it's at a distance, it's through brush, different ways that they've seen it. Mm -hmm. But you've seen it basically right in front of your van. Right. And that that is a rare experience on your part. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, because it was totally so, a quadrupedal like that is pretty rare to see. Wow. Uh, yes. Yes. Wow. But, and that's what kind of threw me because I thought, well, if it's a bigfoot, it should be on two feet. You know, I mean, that's what I was thinking. You know, not really educated at that time. And um, the other thing is, is that it was built like. The reason I think it's a juvenile because it wasn't, like, all bulked out, but it was, like, real lanky. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It was real lanky. And uh, that's, you know, it just, a lot of things, it was just so much to take in at once. Right. Plus, I was trying to keep my daughter, you know, under, you know, trying to keep her cool. Plus, I was trying to, like, I thought, well, if I don't move, maybe it won't see me. I know that's dumb. <laughs> but I was so scared that I didn't want to move, you know what I mean? And it's I a was Jurassic afraid. Park syndrome. <laughs> yeah, maybe he won't see me. You know, um, and I know it's a dumb thought, but it, I am a tree. Yeah, exactly. I'm a wall faller. I'm a tree. You know, and I mean, I know that sounds so dumb, but when you're when you're in that situation and you're so scared, the only thing you can think of is, you know, don't. And I, I literally, when it went in front of us, I swear to God, I didn't breathe. I was just that scared. And and my daughter, um, she, uh, I was trying to keep her calm. And I was also trying to be careful that when I was trying to hold her that, like, my elbow didn't hit the horn or, you know, I didn't, like, accidentally put the car in gear. Yeah, that would have been a real good one. You know what I mean? So, uh, or, you know, keep, I was keep, and I kept my, I moved my feet away from the brake and the accelerator because I didn't want anything, anything to happen. You know what I mean? I was really trying to think all at once. You know what I mean? So... Okay. Amazing that you were thinking of all those things, considering what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, I was really trying to think because you know my daughter was so she she's she's um, uh, real high strong sometimes, and uh, you have to, I think you think of ahead of her, and I just really didn't want her to be so scared that she would jump out of the car and it would just that would just make everything even worse. You know what I mean? Oh, right. So I was trying to you know and and then you know. Because she doesn't, she didn't believe in those things. In fact, um, she's blocked it out of her memory because I was watching um, some crypt show, and it was about Bigfoot. My my daughter came in. She goes, oh, "Mother," she goes, "You will believe anything." And I looked at her. And I just, <laughs> I looked at her. And I went, "Oh, really?" <laughs> I go, "If you only knew what I knew." <laughs> so she's totally blocked it out of her mind. 
she was scared witless. And, you know, I was scared to death. But, you know, you, you're the parent. You have to be, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you have to be the calm one. Have you brought it up lately? Uh, no, I have not talked to her about it at all. And she has not talked to me about it. And right now she's sort of like on a religious path. So I know that if I even tried to bring it up to her, it would be, you know, just dismissed. So, and I'm trying not to to cause her any problems on her journey. But one day we'll talk about it. Here's a good question, question from Spin Dave. Yeah, did it ahead. have an expressionless face or did it appear frightened? Did it have an expressionless face or did it appear frightened or was it, or did it just not care? Um, it's just when it when it when it was up at the um up at the uh the garage when it stopped it looked, and it just looked like, uh, what's the word, like, um, oh, really? What's sort of like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, sort of like. Um, Are you kidding me? What's, pardon me? <laughs> Are you kidding me kind of expression on his face? Yeah, like, sort of like, are, oh, what, what is this? this? Are you kidding me? You know, like, yeah. you're you're there, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's, it didn't appear frightened at all, not at all. Because, like I said, when it went in front of us, man, it didn't even ign- it act like we weren't even there. And that blew me away. Because uh-huh. it saw us up by the garage, and the garage is only about 30 yards away. And so I really didn't get a look, good look at its face, you know I mean, like what it's like the details of its face. But it didn't seem frightened at all. Yeah. Not at all. You, you guys were just kind of a minor inconvenience for it at the moment. You know, it just... It, you know, it, it, yeah, I, I, I see what exactly what you're saying. That's wow. That's wow. Yeah. So okay, it next was question: uh, Was it ape-like or human-like as far as how you felt about it? Uh, it looked a little more. I want to say this. Uh, it wasn't totally ape. Um. It did had it did have some human features, like I couldn't get like a real good look at like, you know what I mean, the face like details, but it looked more. It, it had like the flat nose, but uh, it, it, it like uh, I, I like I didn't see uh, um, like the mouth or anything like that, um, but it was more. Hmm. I don't want to say it was totally ape like, but it was it had some ape features, but it was it was kind of a mix. If you if that makes sense. It would have to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> yeah, some some say they that some of the Bigfoot they've seen had human qualities to that that are that are almost uh, totally human just surrounded by hair. It's mm-hmm. a, a hairy person. Mhm. No, and some no, it say they're like more they're more like a gorilla. So it, it, there are different varieties, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one was like kind of in between. It wasn't uh, totally human or okay either. Yeah, there's going to be regional variations based on geography and climate and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and um, I didn't talk about this for a long, long time. It, it was probably it's been a long time since I've talked. I even, in fact, I didn't tell anybody. Until about two or three months ago, that I had this, that I had this experience, um, because for the simple fact that, you know, who's going to believe me? First of all, it was in the daylight. It was in a semi-residential area, you know, and I thought, <laughs> nobody's going to believe a word I say. Did it grin? Uh, did it at you or or grimace at you? I'm yeah. sorry. Did it grimace it. or grin at you? You know what? I didn't see uh, when it was up at the top. Um, it really didn't like make. I, I couldn't see a facial like a real definite facial expression, but you could just see just by the way it was kind of like its body language, and by like the it was sort of like seriously, seriously. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was kind of the the, the kind of the vibe I got. Okay. You know what I mean? And was he was more wondering like what you were doing out in the middle of the day. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> do 
dude, you know, I was going to cross uh, the road, and you just ruined it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was sort of like the vibe I kind of got. Yeah. You know? Oh. So that's, you know, but, like, when it crossed in front of me, like I said, it was, it blew me away that it didn't even look at me or it didn't even acknowledge us. And I thought, well, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. But, you know. What state know. was this in, Lori? What year? What state? Oh, state right. Ohio. It's in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You said it was in a residential neighborhood? It was like a semi, what it was, is like at the end of this road, okay, when you come, when the end of this road, it come, kind of comes from a rural area. And at the end, of, it's a towards, it goes into another town. And when you come up this road, it starts kind of rural. And there's like houses but they're very much spaced apart, and people can have okay. livestock. Okay. Okay. And then as you so go it's farther kind of like down a the road, rural, rural type neighborhood. Uh, yeah, and but as, yeah. as you go farther down the road, like about about another two miles, it starts to be like more residential. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about anyone else? Do you have any questions for Lori? Okay. Lori, we really appreciate you calling in. This is a fantastic story to start the show with. And I thank you for sharing with us. That's just a, an amazing experience. You don't know how blessed you are to not only see it during the daytime, but to see it in quadrupedal mode, which is so rare. I didn't or, even know uh, that. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is pretty wow. rare. You okay. Know, uh, thank you for calling in. No problem, and I'll be listening on the show here. So, good luck. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Thank Thanks. You so much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Now, I can imagine right. some people want to go and park in that spot for uh, every day for a couple of months and see what happens. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was some Bigfoot's crosswalk. Yeah. That's just incredible. It's incredible. Well, um, if y'all want, we can we can go to Footers. Um, I oh, have we do a... have another. We have oh, another okay. caller. Have a caller. Okay, go ahead. I don't know if he's if the caller is listening in or if they have a story. So I'm going to ask them real quick. Okay. Hello, four oh nine. This is my callers radio. Are you listening in, or would you, or do you have a story? Yes, ma'am. I'm listening in. Are you? Okay. Well, we'll leave you alone then. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to ask you, is there yeah. any other animal in the East Texas area that makes those the, the tree-knocking sounds? I know there's there's woodpeckers, but is there anything else that I could attribute this to? Um, well, <laughs> honestly, I am from East Texas myself, mm-hmm. and they say we have an American bird here. But I've never heard the American bittern. It's some mm-hmm. kind of bird that it makes a sound in its chest, and they try to say that that's what we're hearing. Mm-hmm. But when I've listened to all the recordings of the American bittern, it sounds nothing like wood knocks. Yes, yeah, Tim, and I hear the I hear these at the same time that I hear the coos. And um, really, the the other day for the first time, I heard the clicks, and um, wow. it started out. Real slow at first. It sounded kind of like a woodpecker at the very beginning, but then when it really gets going, it sounds almost like it's digital. And then it went on for like two or three minutes. Is, is that the, the kind of thing? Or the knocking that sounds digital? No, this is the clicks. The clicks. Oh, the clicks. Have y- have y'all heard that much down here? Yes, I've heard the clicks yeah. as well. And, yeah. and to me, I always. One to me, when I was listening to the clicking, it almost sounded like rocks clacking together. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, oh, click, 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 I've heard click, that. Click. Yeah, and it, it, I thought it's got to be an insect or a frog or something like that. But it, I would be hearing that all the time if that was the case. But it's, I don't it's, hear it all not, the time. That's what I would have thought, except we had been out there doing the knocks and the, um, some yells for about 10 minutes straight when it started. 
And um, I would think if it was some kind of little frog or insect, we would have scared it off instead yeah. of, you know. But that that was all I wanted to ask, and I enjoy your show, and <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome, and thank you for asking thank the question. And it's thank interesting you. to know that we've got some East Texas people listening to the show. I'm tickled to death about that. I really am. <laughs> So, uh, yep. you, you have a lot more people out here than you would realize. Yeah, yeah, we're finding that out, and we're you know we try not to think about it, or we'd be a nervous wreck on the show. <laughs> are you part of the group, or are you doing this on your own? Yeah. Right. Y'all, y'all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Yes. Now I'm just gonna put you on hold now. Perhaps. Is she still there? Uh, she's no, that's all right. Oh, she fell out. She fell no, out. No, that's all right. I was just wondering if she okay. did this on her own or with a group of people. Or... It sounds like she does it with a group. So. That's all right. Huh. Yeah. Well, wow. I knew I recognized that area code. That area code <laughs> is not very far from me. <laughs> that's, that's in my, you know, pretty close to my area. It's not my area code, but I know where it's at. So. Yeah, that's that's cool. I'd love to get with them. Go out researching with them sometime. That'd be great. So if you hear me, four oh nine, um uh contact us at nightcallers underscore BTR at yahoo dot com and I'd love to connect up with you and maybe we could all meet up somewhere in between and go out researching. That'd be a blast. So anybody out there that has a story and would like to call in and tell us about your experience, we would love to hear from you. The number is 347-989-0313. That's 347-989-0313. And uh, while we're waiting on um, someone to call in, I think we're going to go ahead and go to footers. You ready? I'm going to do the intro. Okay. Okay. Hello, this is Walter Cronkite, and this is the way it is. Now, with Lauren Smith and Footers in the Field. that I picked for footers today is called In Some Species, Eating Your Own is Good Sense. I know that sounds pretty morbid and disgusting. Um, but, you know, one of the big questions skeptics and researchers alike ask are why are there no bodies found of Bigfoot? Um, you know, I, I've i been asked that a million times by skeptics, and, and I've countered with, well, why don't you see bear or mountain lion bodies laying around, you know, and and they can't answer that, and, well, neither can I. So I just did some research. I was looking, um, just did some research on bear corpses and didn't, didn't really find much at all, but I came across this article. And, you know, one of the theories out there is that Bigfoot, they're dead, and that's why there are no uh, bodies laying around. Anyway, so I came across this article. And I just thought it was interesting and thought I would share. So I'm going to go ahead and read it now. Cannibalism, at least among animals, may not be as bad as it sounds. Biologists once considered the eating of an individual's own species a behavioral mistake made by animals that were unnaturally overcrowded or hungry. But after new analysis, scientists have begun to see that the consumption of one's fellow beings is a shrewd strategy for survival. In fact, among some species, Cannibalism is so com- common that it has molded some of the animal world's most elaborate social behaviors, including courtship and parental care. <clears throat> In a new book, Cannibalism, Ecology, and Evolution Among Diverse Taxa, described as the first comprehensive study of cannibalism, scientists argue that when animals eat their own young, or I'm sorry, not young. Scientists argue that when animals eat their own species, they are not just looking for another meal, but also seeking to destroy competitors in the struggle to survive and reproduce. We humans think it's terrible for a species to eat its own kind. 
But I think that in many situations, cannibalism is a very natural and reasonable thing to do. If food is limited and members of your species are the only thing around, why starve? Cannibalism offers so many advantages that the puzzle is, why does it not occur more often? Said Dr. Gerard J. Fitzgerald, who is a professor of biology at Laval University in Quebec, its, sim its simplest benefit is nutrition. Experiments with mosquito fish and tiger salamanders indicate that the fellow species members may make the most nutritional meals. <clears throat> that could explain why, given the chance, cannibalistic birds will rush to eat the eggs of their neighbors, swallowing everything right down to the shell. Another benefit is controlling scarcity. Burying beetles, the grave diggers and undertakers of the insect world, eat their own young to ensure the right ratio of mouths to food supply. And I know y'all are all picturing what if certain Americans did this. Anyway, the beetles swarm over the corpses of small animals like birds and mice, battling for the ownership until only one male and one female remain. Overnight, the victorious couple slowly prepare their prize for their young to eat, shaving it of hair or feathers, embalming it with a special spray, and finally burying it, matching brood and food. When the young beetles hatch, their parents eat them until their family is down to a size that the food supply can safely support. Somehow the beetles are able to assess the balance between brood size and the food a corpse will provide. Researchers say that like many animals, the beetles are simply maximizing their chances of ending up with a healthy brood that will make it to adulthood. Another advantage of cannibalism may be to give some offspring a head start in life. According to the icebox hypothesis, many animals are thought to stock their nest or womb with an extra with extra offspring that can be eaten by the strongest and fastest growing among the, among the ever hungry brood. Embryonic sharks, for example, gobble one another in the womb. The voracious fishes, known as mitis cichlids, prey on each other when young. Dr. Fitzgerald explains the logic in family cannibalism. Let's suppose that you were stuck on a boat at sea with three of your children and there was no food available. One of the kids was sick, weak, or young, and you decided to sacrifice that kid and eat it so the other kids would live. That would be the perfect example of adaptive cannibalism. It's better if two of the three kids live rather than none. More common, however, is the practice of eating someone else's family, often in an attempt to start one's own. The propensity is so common that parental care in some animals appears to have evolved in large part just to protect the young from cannibals. Among three spined sticklebacks, the male fish aggressively guard broods of fertilized eggs while the female cruises around the marauding bands, destroying nests and eating the eggs. With each nest destroyed, there are new opportunities for the female to mate. <coughs> Even among birds, whom cannibalism is rather rare, will eat their own in a desperate race to reproduce. In the oak forest in the foothills of California's coastal range, acorn woodpeckers share food and help one another care for the young, but the same birds that would also destroy and devour one another's eggs. <coughs> Sorry. Two female woodpeckers often share a nest, but when the one lays an egg first, the other destroys it, perhaps because the egg laid first usually does best. The removal of each other's eggs may continue for weeks, until at last the two birds lay eggs on the same day, thus making it moot who laid at first. As gruesome as eating offspring can be, it's sexual cannibalism that shows the animal world at its most lurid. Of course, you all know about the female praying mantis and spiders as well. Um, and then also you have bears, which I recently, while doing my bear research, found out that um, that's why female bears are so vicious about their cubs, is male bears are looking for female bears and their cubs, and they will kill the cubs so that the female will go back into heat so he can mate with her and produce young. Um, and that's why you'll find female bears and their cubs so close to civilization, because they go out of their way to get out of that male bear's territory so that she can save her cub. Anyway, so that's your footers for the for the week. That's your daily dose. And um anyway, uh it took a it went off on a tangent, but that was information I could not pass up. I thought that was interesting. And um the cannibalism I just thought we could all discuss. Yeah. <laughs> well in, in human populations 
there's two forms of cannibalism. One is called ritual cannibalism, and the other is gustatory cannibalism. And unlike animal species, humans, in, uh, in particular, this is human culture, uh, we will engage in gustatory cannibalism uh, when there is starvation. You know, the Donner Party is a good example, and mm-hmm. then the Indian soccer team um, that was uh, – crashed in the Andes. Uh, you, those are examples of gustatory cannibalism when there's nothing left. There's no food around, so what ends up happening is a person who has died is selected and uh, and that person is consumed. Um, the other form is ritual cannibalism, which is the ingestion of often a family member at death to imbue that person's power within a clan. So um, but that's usually within a ceremonial complex. Um, those are the two forms. You usually don't see cannibalism too much in the higher in higher primates. Um, and to add to the to the thing with the um, the bears, the females uh, uh, taking their young away so that the, the rogue males uh, will not will will eat the young cub to put the mother back in estrus. Cats do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so animals with higher social organization uh, will often use – I wouldn't actually call that cannibalism, though, um, because basically what they're doing is they're killing off the brood so that that female – because usually we have high competition for females um, and animals that have a high order of social organization, that the, the reproductive selection of killing the young so that that – Female gives gives birth to that uh, to the to the alpha male's children. Uh, you see in cats as well, and it's it's mm-hmm. a way of also controlling social organization within uh, an animal society. <clears throat> I just how could I mean how would you apply that to the SAS? I mean, would you? Well, would you that's say a good that question it's... because we have to figure out what a Sasquatch is because, I mean, we can just basically make the assumption that it's either a higher primate or a hominid. And if that's the case, then you could either apply a reproductive model of cannibalism or a cultural model of cannibalism. And I really don't think they eat their young or eat themselves. I think they bury their dead. Or because mm-hmm. there's, there's been one or two cases, the Hanovia case, for instance, in Oklahoma, when one of the family members shot the Sasquatch in the backyard or off their backyard, um, one was seen retrieving the dead Sasquatch um, over its shoulder and taking it away. So that would indicate to me that there's there's a means of hiding their dead, whether they're yeah. burying it ceremonial or ritually or they're just burying their dead so they're not found, um, I think is a possibility. Well, some have tried to postulate that if a young male is tossed out of a family, he goes out on his own, and he's got to find a, and establish his own family, um, would there possibly possibly be a chance, like what horses do and what other males of uh, other animals do, is they fight for uh, an existing family? And if they went into that existing family, you know, this is all it's hypothetical, would they, would they kill the children of that family? family in order to be able to reestablish his own genetics along those lines. It's, it's possible, but I think really with with uh with with higher order mammals in particular, uh, you know, it, you, the the idea of passing on the, the selective genes of, you know, I'll use just for rough purposes the alpha male, you know, uh and so that it's his genes being passed on. Um, uh, that you would see that in some, but the thing about the saw, if we're applying this to the Sasquatch is, you know, first of all, you're, you're dealing with theory, you know, because we don't know exactly what the Sasquatch is, but, you know, I would be more inclined to look at, you know, uh, the Sasquatch, uh, the alpha male. I mean, Grover Kranz talked about this, you know, um, in the, in the field of primatology, when you have, um, a high competition for females, um, what ends up happening is you end up having males 
who are competing for the affections of a female. But it, but what ends up happening in that kind of structure is that um, there's an order of how uh, primates form alliances with one another, and that will reflect how a hue gets favor in reproduction. Now, which is really interesting about the rogue male theory is orangutans in the wild are what are called matrifocal primates, which is the the females give birth to the young and then they raise them alone. Um, in an orangutan society, uh, the males, those that are the largest, have selection of the females for reproduction and then after uh, so many years, those juvenile groups form rogue groups where the males gather um, because they're no longer, uh, they'd be competition within that group. So they actually go off and form their own families. So this this was a theory that Krantz actually believed possibly uh, the Sasquatch are doing, uh, possibly that, that in fact the the juvenile males go off and form rogue groups until they find other females to reproduce and have small families with. Um, and, and this pattern could be replicated in a very small-scale uh, primate group. I mean, this is this is a theory, a possible theory. And Lori? Yes. Okay. We, we, we do have, have a caller. Have a caller. Right. Yes, we do. So we're going to go ahead and go to that caller. Hey, Kenny, that was yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your vast knowledge on this subject. <laughs> I knew you were going to bite on that. Kenny and I could have gone a little further on that one. I had a couple of statements I could have gone into, but we'll go with the caller. Okay. 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 614, you're on Night Callers Radio. Do you have a story to tell us? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Eric Tipton. Um, Hi, um, Eric. How are you? I had a feeling that was you. <laughs> <laughs> we are so What's glad up? to hear from you. You're an extremely popular man, I want to tell you right now. You and Michael both. Well, thank you. A lot of downloads on your show. I just wanted to tell you that. You guys are really kicking butt. That's so, awesome. Yes. Yes, it is. So, hi, do you have a new story to tell us, Eric? Uh, actually, um, we've kind of been a little, uh, taking a little hiatus. Um, mm -hmm. Right now we're in the peak of gun season in Ohio for deer. So, yeah, uh, that'll slow just, things down for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. So, and we uh, we went out. I I think the last time I spoke to you guys, um, that was the last last week we went out. Uh, we took Thanksgiving weekend off, um, but I've been doing uh, quite a bit of research online uh, with Ohio. There's there's so many places still here, you know that. Uh, we haven't, you know, even scratched the sur surface of going out and, and researching. Um, one one spot though that uh, uh, we're really looking at. Um, my wife and I were out last year. It was the beginning of, of uh, hunting season, and we were out walking, and it was actually in an area that that I do hunt and. It's really strange because when I go out there and hunt, I, I'm kind of like tunnel vision. You know, I'm there to hunt. I'm not there to do anything else. But we were kind of walking through the woods, and I noticed a a teepee structure. And I took some pictures of it, you know, and I'm explaining it to my wife, you know, about Sasquatch and what they do. Uh, and then we came up on a couple other structures. Uh, farther, even even farther back into the woods, and um, so I started doing some research, and this kind of just clicked in my mind, you know, as we were off for Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, so I started doing some research of that area, and I would say probably about forty, 
40, well, not even 40 miles, maybe less than maybe 35, 30 miles south of that area. Um, <laughs> last year, three months, I think it was three months prior to us being out into the woods, there was a sighting. Um, and it was on the back side of a rest area, and a truck driver had had actually well when i i i shouldn't say siding um it was uh he found prints, and the prints though were leading back in this this rest area all the way back in the back by the by the tree line are all their dumpsters um and this these tracks were leading from the dumpsters and going through a 200-yard field, cornfield, and into the woods to the Scioto River that runs through Ohio. Um, so he did some re- – he, he actually posted pictures um, out on another uh, website, and the guy did – phenomenal for not even being a researcher or anything and, and and taking pictures of these tracks and he had them measured out and numbered and he literally uh-huh. he tracked these these prints all the way back 200 yards from the dumpster 200 yards through the field and lost them into the woods um but it was kind of strange though that you know that we're out there you know and i start seeing these things that I, I probably walked by a hundred times out there hunting and just never, never took the time to stop and look around. You know, like I said, I, I was so fixated on hunting that I, you know, I, I wasn't looking around at anything. And then when my wife and I were out there, and you know, and then I started seeing these things, and I'm like, wow, you know. And I, the, the farther back we would go, I would see a twist break, I would see another, you know, structure built literally built um so and then to find then to go out on this this other website and to see this you know encounter you know 30 miles 35 miles down the road you know at a rest stop you know and then to blow it up on on satellite imagery and there's a huge huge state park just on the other side of the river from this from this uh uh rest area rest uh, there's a huge state park just on the other side of this river. So I think that's going to be one of our next next areas to hit um, and take a look around. Other than other than that truck driver, though, there has never been any other uh, sightings in that area. Um, and I went back, like way back, you know, on dates to look, and and there was nothing, and which doesn't mean anything. You know, it, it it doesn't mean just because you see one sighting, you know, and it's like, oh, that was in 2010, you know, and that's just right. one sight. That doesn't, that means nothing. He can, they can be using that waterway on the Scioto. They can be traveling that waterway. Um, he, he could go for miles. and it, it, uh, A whole family of them could go for miles and never be seen, ever, you know. So I think we're going to uh, to hit that here here real soon. Um, and one of the upsides to that, though, is it's a it's not a wildlife area, you know. So there's yeah. no hunting, you know. So so you guys getting uh, the pattern yet, where you can focus in on a single area over over time? Yeah, yeah, we are in in actually actually our area will will be where we had our major encounter back in July down in Wayne National. That is going to be our base camp. Um we we know we we know we were there in July. We know they were there in July and the last time I was on with you guys when you and I spoke and and uh you mentioned, you know, maybe going in a month prior um to right. July, and I, I, Mike and I are both. We agreed, you know, and, and you're right. We are going to do that. We we might even go two months, you know, prior. We may go like late late May, you know, mid May, uh, and just to just to kind of set up base camp, you know, uh, maybe just go out and do a little light scouting, nothing real heavy, you know, 
um, and then just kind of kind of uh, hunker down and and uh, you know wait, you know, and 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 see see what happens. But that that's going to be our our main our main objective going into the next year. You know, is is that that's one that spot. one that one area that one spot? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so you're going to so, try to draw them in, or are you going to be doing you're doing hunting? No, we're going to we're going to we're going to try to uh, we're going to try to get them to come to us, um, which I don't think will be an issue at all. I really don't um, because of what we had last time. Um, I don't I don't think that will be a problem with them coming in. It's just it's it's and hopefully hopefully they'll know us. You know, and like I said, the last time I was on, uh, we go in the same way, we leave the same way, we wear the same gear each time. So I think if we do the exact same thing and go in, you know, that will bring them in. But this time we want to be able to go to that next level and um, and actually get that, that visual confirmation, you know, get that visual, have them comfortable enough to where they they allow us to visually see them you know and then we'll just start building you know building from there you know and you'll have to have your own identity calling card when you walk in the door oh yeah oh yeah most definitely most definitely and 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 i i do you know i i i, I don't know if i should or would contribute what i do when i when i go in and we get to that first uh plateau and you know i i do the hand you know the hello hand sign, and then but every time I did that though, we would get the knock. You know every uh-huh. single time when I started doing the hello sign, right after that we would get the first knock. You know, and and I I I firmly believe that them that's them going okay. You know, knocking, we acknowledge you. We know who you are. We know you're here. You know now you know we're here. Let's move forward, you know. Mm. And, yeah, but then what? So. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then what? Yeah, right, right. You know, and that's 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 the you know the million dollar question. You know, then what? You know, um, are are we a uh, you know full course meal or are we you know friends or you know uh, <laughs> where, where where do we go from here, guys? <laughs> you know? Um but i i honestly i don't i don't believe there's there's any any harm to us at all you know um i don't think so either as long yeah, as you're that, not being aggressive towards them exactly or, exactly uh, the and, Indians and have been it, doing this for, for centuries it's it, it, we're trying to get some city civilized people that we've been uh almost like invaders to this country how do we break ourselves down to the point to be able to communicate with something like that? Exactly, exactly. You know, and, the, and almost like we it, have to go down a little bit and and get rid of our minds and get a little bit more into the natural thing. We have to. You're you're exactly right. We have to get back to our primitive instincts. That is gone in our culture. There, it's not. It, you know, it's almost non-existent anymore. You know, and both that you're right. We have to get back to that. You know, we have we have to get back to that primitive, you know, way of of life. You know, uh, in order to be able to communicate with them. Um, and that's you know, and one other thing too that I I firmly believe I believe that they do bury their their dead. And I've wondered, you know, numerous times when. Michael and I have something happen where they acknowledge we're there, whether it be, you know, a, a, a knock or we'll get the, uh, well, one of the last times we were out at Salt Fork, we were actually leaving. We get a lot of, an, a lot of, uh, interaction when we're leaving, when they know we're moving out of the area, we'll start getting a lot of interaction from them. Uh, and one of the last times we were out at Salt Fork, we got up on the ridge that we had just came off of. We got the, ooh, ooh, ooh. I mean, just very loud, very deep, and it went from a low to a very high, like, ooh, 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 you know, and then 
that was it. Um, but I, I wonder, I always wondered, you know, if, if they, if they bury their dead and you're walking through the woods and then all of a sudden you get something that, that happens, do they consider their, where they bury? Is it, um, is it sacred? Is it sacred ground? Uh, no different than the, the, you know, the Native American, is it a sacred ground? And you don't know. You're just, you're traipsing through the woods. A Bigfoot graveyard. Yeah, and if you walk up to the sacred grave site that you have no clues under your feet, you know, and then all of a sudden you get all hell that breaks loose, you know, is that them trying to let you know, hey, look, you know, you're traipsing through our grave site, you know? And I've always wondered that. Um, we are we are at the intermission mark, and we have a question from Lori One Hundred Three, and she's wanting to know, Eric, what happened in Wayne National. And if you don't mind hanging on, Eric, we'll come to you after the intermission, and you can tell us what happened in Wayne International. And also, uh, we 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 hang on. We stay sure. on the air. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, I also have a vocal that I want to play um, that I recorded last Easter. And okay. uh, Laura knows what I'm talking about because she was here when we were hearing it. And so I wanted to play that. So um, you can hear uh, Graz's <laughs> clock. <laughs> no, that's Kenny's clock. That's, that's my clock. clock. Sorry. It's, it's 10 o'clock and all's well. All's <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. Um, Graz, I'm going to go ahead and let you pick it up on the other side. Uh, just in case I don't get back, I've got to go run and do something real quick. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and go to intermission, and we'll be back with Eric when we get back.
Well, <clears throat> here we go again. <clears throat> Nobody told me how long that song was going to be. So here I am, sucking down on a chocolate chip cookie, and the song ends. <laughs> Blame that one on Lauren. <laughs> Billy, take her out and give her a spanking. Billy says oh. he went to the can and came back to Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking in, I'm like, what is this, you know? <laughs> I, thought, I thought that grand got put in charge of, you know, the musical selection tonight. I was looking for yeah. Candace. The song was was just sitting there looking at me. I could tell us how long. When's that song going to end? I don't don't know. Just wait until it stops. Got a mouthful of chocolate chip cookie when it stops. That's good timing on my part. Grant was flashing back to Woodstock. (laughs) And then nothing around the Woodstock. (laughs) It's all legal here in the Western States. One great big Woodstock. (laughs) I want him to go ahead and tell about the afterwards. Uh, I want to play this vocal because a while ago you said you were you were mimicking the sounds that they make, almost apish. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was recorded at my house, which anyone that's ever been out here knows that I live in a very um, desolate area of River Bottom. Not very many close na one close neighbor and. Other than that, it's just miles of nothing. But wood, Booger Hill. River, flues, yeah, Booger Hill. So anyway, this was recorded uh, at Easter, and it only lasted just a week or so. And I was on vacation that week, and I was hearing it during the day. And it was coming out from out in the woods, and I could not figure out what it is. Now, I'm going to let you all listen to this and see if you can make out what it is or what it sounds like to you. So I'm I'm playing this for everybody, not just Eric. Okay, so here we go. That's the bird. (laughs) No kidding, right? Oh, 
Okay. Now, I believe there was a dog in there barking at the other sound. Now, I don't know if it's a dog, but it just had a weird, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's just almost like an ape sound to me. And I, it was it would do it every evening about 5 o'clock. It would be out there. And I was thinking if it's a dog, I would be hearing it all day, not just the well, time of the day. The one, the one part where you, you can hear it, it's it's a low and high, and it's together. It's not. There's not a break. I think right. it's the, the when the when you first hear it, you hear a low high um, uh-huh. sound, and there's not a break there. Um, so the other one did. The single one sounded like a dog, but yeah. even yeah. even dogs. Um, They'll have they'll have a break. They can they'll and they'll bark low, and they'll bark high, and they'll bark medium. But there's always a break in between. You can tell a dog mm-hmm. bark. Um, but that first one that the first one that you hear it's it's simultaneous. There's no break in between the low and the high. It's a it was a you know just straight yeah you know, mm-hmm. low high yeah and that yeah. that's yeah. what I heard out at Salt Fork. It, but it it was actually a a three a three tone it was a uh, a uh, uh, it it grew low medium high but very fast you know um very uh uh diaphragmed you know uh and that's what that sounded like was a yeah was a was a a groan like a low groan to, to a high with no break in the middle um so that's Another me, interesting that's... thing about this this recording was that it moved. Whatever it was, it would be over in this part of the woods, and then it would move like it. It, it started out sort of to the northeast, and then it was in the east, and then it was in the southeast. And yeah. uh, whatever it was was moving. Whereas the dog stayed stationary in one place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, hmm, I just. Wanted to see what you thought, if that was similar to what you had heard. Yeah, it certainly it struck me and Lauren as very strange. And, yeah. of course, it, it does it, you know, for over 45 minutes to an hour, just off and on. So, really? Uh, yeah. Huh. And huh. so I, I, that wasn't the best capture, I don't think, of what I could have gotten. I was just trying to grab it up real quick so I could share it and... Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, Lori One Hundred Three is still waiting to hear about what happened at Wayne National. If you don't mind sharing that with us, and anyone that would like to call in, we urge you to call in. The number is three four seven nine eight nine zero three one three. If you have a story to tell us, a uh, Sasquatch related story or experience, three four seven nine eight nine zero three one three. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, it was actually uh, back in July, this past July, uh, my partner and I were down in uh, part of Wayne National here in Ohio, and uh, we had been hiking quite a long time, about five hours into it, uh, and we had crossed like six ridges, um, and we were on top of this ridge, and we're looking out over over this you know valley and we see this just this huge huge ridge uh much taller than any of the other ones and we decided we were going to go ahead and hit that ridge you know that was going to be our last push for the day so we we made our way to it and uh we got to the base of the ridge we started climbing it and we got about halfway up and there was a, a flat plateau and we were kind of we were on that little plateau and kind of hanging out, um, taking a breather. And above us, at the top of the ridge, um, it just all, all heck just broke loose. Uh, something had taken a uh, a, ch- a tree branch. It, it sounded it, it was it was a tree branch. It was a very large tree branch, and 
uh, the last time I was on the show, I I had mentioned I had said that if I was to describe to you what if I was looking at something with the sound that it made, it was holding probably a, a six to you know eight foot long, four inch to six inch round tree branch, and just commenced to destroy it on a on another tree. Um, it did it four times. Uh, did it twice, uh, back to back, really fast. Boom, boom, and you could hear the wood splintering each time it hit the tree. You could hear the wood splintering off this branch. Uh, but it did it twice. Boom, boom, and then paused for a few seconds, uh, and then did it two more times. Boom, boom. Um, so at this point, you know, I mean, not expecting it. We didn't see anything all day. Didn't see any signs, of anything. Nothing really to report on or or, you know, make reports on. Um, and then we're, you know, we're hanging out on this on this little plateau and we hear this, you know, so the first two two breaks, you know, we're like, you know, startled, you know, and all senses are high and, and then it does it two more times and then we're like, you know, okay, we're hanging out for a couple minutes and, you know, trying to trying to get our minds wrapped around what we just heard. Um and then that was above us on the ridge that we were climbing. To the right of us was a gorge and then another ridge. Um, from the ridge to the right of us, we start, right after the tree breaking, um, we start getting knocks from the ridge to the right of us. Uh, and then we start getting uh, small rocks tossed from the ridge over the gorge at us. So now we're now now we know there there's no doubt there's no question we know what we're dealing with and there's more than one. Um, at this point, I'm looking up the ridge that we're climbing and I I'm scanning to the right and I'm I'm looking to the right and I look across the gorge and I hit the the ridge to the right of us. And probably about 100 yards out, my eyes fixate on something staring at me. And it's it's behind a tree. Uh, there's tall brush beside it to the right of it. And I'm fixated on two sets of eyes. Um, it's like if, if, if you tilt your head to the right, you know, just sideways to the right, you see the forehead, the eyes, nose and then partial mouth and that's what i'm staring at um and i i literally i just i don't lose it you know but i'm trying to get michael my partner my research partner uh i'm trying to get him to 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 see it from from that distance though you know it's like go to the tree to the right of the tree you know it's just you know he can't he can't see what i'm looking at and and uh, I stare at this thing. We're locked eye to eye for a good two minutes, if not longer. It felt like a lifetime to me. But um, and then all of a sudden, it, it it pulls back. It just it disappears. Pulls back. Um, so at this point, we're like, okay, what do we do? Do we do we keep going straight up to the sound, or do we make our way around to the right? You know, in between the two ridges and the gorge. And uh, we, we opted to, to go around to the right and we make our way around and we come up to this huge oak tree that had, that had fallen and it, it was wedged inside another tree. So it was like, it was, it was a, like a 30 degree vertical incline. And uh, we get to this fallen tree and as we're as we're literally making our way around to that tree, though, we're still getting the knock, the knock sound, but from the ridge to the right of us. Um, but the rock throwing did stop. Once we started moving towards the right, the rock throwing did stop, but we'd still get the knock. Um, so at this point, we get to this fallen tree, and my partner decides he's going to climb this fallen tree. And I'm standing there. I've got my back towards the ridge where we heard the, the tree being broke or the branch, the branch being busted, and I'm looking at the ridge to the right of us. 
And Michael starts climbing this tree. He gets up to the top of this fallen tree, which is about, I don't know, 30 feet up. And I'm staring at the bridge to the right of us. We're still, every now and then, we're still getting this knock. And then from behind me, no no more than 20 yards, it, and I will say if that, in the, in the thick, dense brush, I get what sounds like a clap, like, you know, clapping with the hands. Or, or like a like a hand like cupped hand smacking a tree right behind me, and I I freeze. Uh, my hair stands up on the back of my neck, you know, and I'm I'm froze. And, uh, and like I said before on the show, it, it, at that point I was I was literally strictly survival mode. You know, what do I do if if things go way south here? Michael's 30 feet up in the tree. I know there's one to the ridge to the right of us, you know, that, that was tossing rock. And I know for a fact there's one right behind me. What, worst case scenario, what do I do? So I climb up on top of the base of the fallen tree, and at, at this point I'm looking for an exit. I'm, if, if, if things go south, I'm looking for an exit. My only exit at that point was straight down. My only exit was to jump. If, if something was to happen, I was jumping off that, off that fallen tree straight down into that gorge. That was, that was the only thing I could think of. Um, now at this point, Michael is up on, on, on the fallen tree and he has, a, he's recording on his phone. And he pans down. You can see me at the bottom. I'm looking back at where I just heard the clap. Um, and then his camera moves to the right or to the left. I can't remember. But then you hear four claps, and that's me. I do four claps right after you hear the fourth clap. I mean, right after you get um, rock clacking. ta 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 And it's clear. I mean, it's crystal. It's, it's there. You cannot mistake it, the sound of it. It's it's rocks clacking each other, um, and then and then we started getting. Then we once we stopped again, and he was up in the tree, and I was on the base, and we'd stop moving. Then we started getting the the little rocks tossed at us again. Um, so at this point, uh, um, Michael comes back down off the tree, and. Uh, I, Mike wants to go, he wants to go up on top of the ridge where we heard the, the branch being broke. And I was, I was firmly dead set against it. I did not want to go in there. Um, I was still in survival mode. I didn't want to do it. Um, and Michael was like, I need to know. I need to, I need to make sure that it isn't somebody up there doing it. I, we, I need to make sure that there's no humans up in this area. And at that point, it kind of calmed me down, you know, and my, and my research part of me kicked back in, you know, and I realized, you know, you're, you're right. You know, this is why we're here, you know, um, and, and we need to know. So we push, we push up on top of the ridge, and we get to the very, very top of it, we go through the dense, thick brush and nothing, you know. Um, and we get to the very top, and we come into a small group of pines. And this is where Michael, uh, we found an X. An X. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that on the last the last time I was on or not, but we we had come up into these pines, and there's a huge X that is that is braced up between two pine trees. Uh, from two smaller uh, trees, they were probably I don't know three inches round, twelve feet tall, and um, they were uprooted and taken to the spot. We had actually found what we believe were the bases of those of those trees, where they were broke off, and they were probably fifteen twenty yards away from where the X was put. Um, so Michael decides he's going to build a little teepee structure underneath the X bracing or the X and leave like a little offering on top of the little teepee structure. Um, 
Now, why he's doing this, um, I I had taken off my rucksack, you know, and I'm I'm digging through my rucksack, and I find in the bottom of my I would have had I would have had all this on video, every bit of it would have been on video. When we were making our way over to that ridge, I'd fallen and I'd broken my my friggin' tripod that my camera is on. So I stuffed my camera and my tripod in my rucksack, and then we went on. And so now we're up on top of the ridge. We're in the pines, and I got my rucksack off, and I'm I'm digging through it. And in the very bottom of my rucksack, there's my GoPro. And I'm like, for well, sure it is. You know, I thought it, I thought I'd left it at home. So, anyways, I pull out my GoPro and I got the headband for it, and I I stick it on my head and I turn it on. And I have this on video also. Um, and I'm kind of, Mike's doing his thing, building the structure. And you see me panning around, and I stop. And then you hear me tell Michael, I just saw two trees move. Now, you don't see this on the GoPro because when I put it on my head, I didn't adjust it properly and it's facing upward so everything everything to to you know (laughs) every everything that a skeptic would go well see that that's why i i played right into every bit of it um but anyways i as michael was was building the structure i'm just kind of standing there and i'm paying i'm looking around and i look to the left of me and as i look to the left there's two saplings that, when I looked, they were coming back together, bouncing back together as if something had two had its hands in the middle of them and had them spread apart, looking at us. And as I was turning, it let go, and the two two saplings came back together. And then I paused for a minute, and you hear me on the GoPro, but I paused for a second, and what the reason I pause is because I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for wind. I'm waiting for birds. You know, I wanted to make sure there was no wind. It was a very humid, very calm day. There was no birds flying around. It was very quiet, very quiet. So I'm standing there for a minute, and you can see me on the GoPro. Well, not you can't see me, but on the GoPro, I'm still. I'm not moving. And that's what I'm doing. I'm looking dead at those saplings. And I'm waiting to see if there's wind that could have done it or birds that could have done it. Nothing. There's not. There's nothing. And then you hear me tell Michael I'm, I, on the video. I'm, I said, Mike, I just I just saw two saplings close. Um, so at that at that point, I knew then that we were being observed. I knew that we were being watched, even though I didn't see a face. I didn't see anything close those saplings. Uh, or looking through them, it was from what we just experienced, you know, our our encounter. And I knew that we were being observed. Um, and at that point, believe it or not, I was. I, it set me at ease um, because when we were making our way from the fallen tree up to the top of the ridge, going through the very dense, very brush, at any given time, this thing could have came at us. At any given time, it could have come out from from anywhere and snapped our necks. There's no doubt about it, and it didn't. So it kind of put me at ease. Like, okay, I knew then it it wasn't there to do any harm to us, you know. And and now now it was wanting to. It was curious, you know. What what are they doing? Let's let's check these two out for a little while and see see what they're up to. You know, um, so it calmed me. It calmed me even more. Um, uh, and then that was that was that was pretty much it um, for that for that day. Um, I think the I think the first bashing when we first got up on the first plateau, I think the the first four bashing of the of the tree branch was a deterrent. Um, yeah, I I believe that we stumbled upon him or her. Uh, and it went, oh crap! You know, there's not supposed to be humans here. You know, you guys are, <laughs> you guys are way off the beaten trail here, guys. You know, and <laughs> I think it was, I think it was a deterrent. I think it was either a mother or a father that did the bashing of the branch. 
I think it was a, a, a an adolescent. I think it was a child that was on the other ridge, um, and and the adult did that to deter us, to to push us out, so it could get to its young, you know. And I think the I think the uh, the rock throwing from the other ridge from the young one was a deterrent, you know, at the beginning. And I believe that the the knocking that we heard from the ridge to the right from the young one was to let its its mother or father know what its position was, where it was at. And then once they realized that we weren't going to be pushed out from them and we kept pushing forward, but they knew that we weren't to harm them, it it turned into curiosity for them. Um so and that that was that was pretty that was pretty much it for for for, for that day, um, and uh, we and, and such thorough details too. Uh, amazing! That's just yeah. such thorough detail. Oh uh, yeah! Oh yeah! Our yeah! Folks in it's, the chat are just loving it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh no problem! No problem! I I enjoy telling it. To be honest with you, I really do, and I so look forward to to our next encounter after that. You know, I really do. Yeah. I it it just it fuels a fire in you. You know, it it just stokes yes, it that does. fire. You know, so yeah. and that you want to keep pushing forward. That's that's well, it. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a friend that has just called in, and I'm gonna go over to him. I know he said he was just listening in, but I, I want to say hello to him. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Armando on. Hi, Lori. Can you hear me? Yes. How you doing, Armando? Long time no hear. Uh, sorry, I've I've been away. Uh, you know, my better half and I, we've had uh, a lot of uh, family stuff um, happen to us, mainly on her side. But long and short of it is, she is still fortunate enough to have both of her grandmothers. One is 93 oh, and the wow. other is 94. And oh, both, la- both ladies are definitely, you know, 93 and 94 years young. And anyway, long story short, um, they both have ended up in a, uh, you know, assisted living facility. So that way they don't have to worry about themselves too much. And there's people there to help them out with, you know, basic stuff that they may not be able to do. But long and short of it is, you know, that's kind of pulled me away a lot. Uh, pulled me away a lot from, you know, from doing this yeah. and things I like. But... Tonight, I made it a point to jump in here and let you know that I'm still alive. And uh, thank I, I, God for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was hoping to see you down at the uh, conference that was that, that was held over at Jefferson last month I in uh, know. October. I it was very interesting. I completely forgot about it. Shame on me. Mm-hmm. I completely forgot about it. I didn't know if I'd still be welcome. Actually, well, um, I. I you know? I kind of got into it with one of the people there years ago, and I tried to go to a conference. They wouldn't let me in. Oh, so wow. I haven't been oh, back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a, a – yeah. I'll I have to tell you about it on the side sometime. Oh, well, yeah. I'd love <laughs> but to hear I didn't it. know if I would be allowed back in there or not. I don't know if enough time has passed by that. I, you well, know, you can't hardly go in this field without making a few enemies. I mean, it just happens. Yes, and, it's, it's, uh, I, I totally agree. I've been, uh, like I said, I, I don't claim to be, you know, you know, an expert of, of anything. I, I just try to apply some logic and reasoning, you know, in regards to, to everyone's uh, accounts and, and, and events that have happened to them. And that still always brings me back to the question, and, and you know, except for the true believers who've had the, the experiences, you know, um, that everyone still has it stuck in their head that the Sasquatch are, you know, in the context of man versus animal, that, that they are animals. And, and, you know, all the things I hear brings me back to they can't be animals in the sense that people think of them as unthinking because if yeah. they were, then they wouldn't be able to actively avoid, you know, game cameras. Yeah. You know, I, because I don't know of any animal that can, so, you know, it all comes back to that. But going back to the conference, um, I, I have uh, – it was interesting. I met a lot of good people there. Um, I mainly went for uh, 
for networking purposes, just to meet other researchers uh-huh. around here in the Houston area. And I, and I did, I met a few. Um, let's see, Arla, Arla um, introduced Williams. me. Yes, yeah. Miss Arla Williams introduced me to a gentleman. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dale Ryan. She introduced me to him, and then, uh, you know, we went out to, to his location, and it was uh, quite interesting. Um, you know, Is that to, the first time you've actually got to research with somebody else? Yes, I did, with, with, with someone that had, uh, a, a, for lack of better words, they had a location that was actually active, you know, and he had had, um, he had, had his, you know, encounters there, and uh, it was really interesting, but um, my little little bit that we had because we showed up in the afternoon it was i would say it was probably about three to four o'clock in the afternoon and uh i me i I went in there kind of skeptical but at the same time saying okay let's you know you know let's see what happens and um i was uh we showed up in yeah we showed up at about three we very you know it was very very much informal i guess for lack of better words when I stepped out and, and uh, we stopped and walked around a little bit, uh, the wind was going. And uh, at right as we got in there, I could, you know, you know, I, I heard a loud knock. And of course, the wind was blowing, so you know how that gets in your ears and it kind of mm-hmm. causes sound. But you know, I thought back about, you know, I've often thought about this little, you know, ten, fifteen minutes. You know, once when I when I got there, and it was it was really interesting because, you know, it was a loud, clear knock. It kind of reminded me of um, someone grabbing a hickory handle, you know, that go, that you would put on a pickaxe and just mm-hmm. smacking it as hard as they can on a tree. And you know, it, it was really interesting. That's about all we got as far as any type of interaction. But I thought maybe these. Uh, I thought maybe these, the, you know, the Sasquatch people out there, you know, were just kind of staying back off in the distance to whereas, you know, since I was somebody new, a new face there with Dale. So, <laughs> but it was uh-huh. enjoyable. And uh, that was really interesting. Um, I haven't had a chance I'm to so get back out there. I'm so glad you got to go out there. I am so glad you finally, and I am sorry I didn't make it to the conference to meet you. Oh, I apologize. That's okay. I no, no, that's, that's try okay. To make it here. <laughs> well, that's great because, like I said, I've been meaning to get together. And, you know, hopefully we get together. Hopefully, once it starts, maybe if there's a chance that it warms up or whatever, you yeah. know, within the end of this month and start of next month. Because I've always been curious, and, and I don't know if anyone is, uh, you know, anybody has had any real experiences when it's been really, really cold or, or you know, it, it's just uh, I'm curious as to how they they. Uh, you know, what they do to deal with the cold. It's really interesting. <laughs> well, they seem to love the cold, honestly, uh, oh. up to a point. that I've noticed that, like, in the dead of winter, yes. there's not a lot of activity. Uh, I don't know if they go somewhere else. Are they low? I'm not sure exactly what happens. But um, we've had activity in January, February, uh, when it's really, really cold but not as much as we do in the fall and the early and the late summer and yes. the spring. So I, um, I'm just <laughs> like I said, I, I I'm curious because uh there's a few other things that, that, that I've thought about regarding um, you know, you know since the uh, and I always revolve around my thinking around the Sasquatches, if they are human I'm not uh-huh. saying Homo sap- I'm not saying Homo sapiens sapien, which is what we are. That uh-huh. is the specific human we are, but they are human. What we would call them, of course. I picked up along the way the Homo sapien hirsuti, you know, hairy, hairy wise man. Yeah, you know, I picked that up. I, I forgot. I, I'd heard it somewhere. Someone coined it before I did, so I'm not claiming that I coined it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> however, however, um, them being human, you know, if you look at it from that perspective but don't apply homo sapien sapien which is what we are if we apply basic human things then then i think a lot of things are thrown in pers- into perspective that and hence i you know i think about what they do in the winter you know is there a, a, a cave system around these areas that we don't know about 
because caves are, are nice and you know they're, they're they're a place to stay warm in the winter time and of course summertime at certain places they're nice and cool and then I'm also a firm believer that even though you know we're here in, I'm here in the north in the northern side of the Houston area and all along East Texas I'm more than certain that you know I feel it in my heart deep down that every inch of the, all those you know all the deep pines out there have not been explored you know. <laughs> So, yeah. yes, ma'am. And uh, so, I mean, uh, I've been out of the loop, sort of, but I've been, you know, I've, I've mainly been reading and just staying abreast of it. Uh, and I have been curious, you know, in regards to uh, the dog man as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, uh, that's an, We have had, uh, the, here in Ohio, um, I had wondered that myself, you know, do they migrate? What do they do? Uh, and that is actually my curiosity you know, or me thinking that was kind of cured last year. We, Ohio went through a major, major deep freeze last year. Oh, wow. uh, and it pushed, it pushed all the way up through the end of March. And I'm talking, we were in, in mid or in, in the beginning of March, we were still in the twenties. Oh wow! And yeah, yeah, and we had actually, my partner and I had actually went out to uh, Salt Fork here in Ohio, and that was uh, we had found a fresh set of tracks, and uh, we actually saw followed the tracks and and actually lost them in the snow. It it had snowed the night before, and um, so we were like, awesome! You know, if there's something there, we're going to see tracks in the snow. Well, when we came up to the spot. It was the sun was just coming through these trees and it melted the snow where we found these fresh tracks. And as we followed them then into the woods where the sun wasn't yet, that we lost them underneath the snow. Um, so at that point, I was like, "Well, they're here, you know. They 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 obviously stay, you know. So, but you're right. Yeah, what do what do they do though? You know, in the winter they." You know, especially harsh, harsh conditions like that. You know, how do they how do they protect themselves from the elements? You know, um, do do they find caves? Do they build you know structures? You know, uh, nests. You know, but then you have to look at also what do deers do? Deers live in harsh conditions like that every single day, and all they do is find find a uh, high grass and make a circle and lay down, you Mm -hmm. know, and and they, and they live perfect, you know? Um, You know, I, I, I I would, I would definitely, uh, you know, I would definitely, uh, you know, take that, you know, and and take it seriously because, well, they, Mm -hmm. they do have a coat of hair. Uh, I'm currently growing, you know, uh, growing my beard out, Lori, if you don't know. No, uh, I've seen your picture. Yes. (laughs) And um, the thing with it is, is uh, you know, I, this was part of my own personal experimentation. I said, I want to see how much of a difference having, because I do have very thick facial hair, and I've only been growing my my beard out for two months. That's it. Mm-hmm. And so it's 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 you know, <laughs> all my friends and people that know me have uh, they they comment that my beard is so thick, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I got lucky. But um, you know. I've been experimenting with, you know, exactly how much, you know, heat does it retain, you know, how well does, you know, how will will how well will my beard protect my face, you know, it will, it, and and it so, will. Um, you know, and so I think of those things, and so I, I'm I'm fairly certain that since they have that nice thick, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure since they've always lived, you know, in in. I guess you could say uh, in harmony with nature. I'm sure their uh, I'm sure their 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 coat gets you know the hair on their body gets thicker in the winter time. Just you know just out of common sense for any animal who lives an animal I mean by everybody human you know human four legged you name it that lives out in in the elements in tune with nature it, it would make perfect sense that it gets thicker. Um, the thing that I that I'm curious about in in, in Again, like I said, these are just hypotheses. I stop and think about historically the Native Americans um, of the East 
were, um, you know, they, they lived in these, you know, in the thick, lush woods, you know, of the northeast and all that area, you know, the, the all of the uh, – all the tribes of the Iroquois Nation, uh, any Al- uh, uh, as well as the Algonquin Nation, all those, and we're thinking, you know, we're talking back 300 years, you know, mm-hmm. and they had a different, uh, for lack of better words, they had a different style of living as the Plains, you know, the Native Americans that that, that lived out in the Plains, such as the Sioux, the Comanche, uh, the Blackfeet, all of them, you know, different uh, different lifestyles for so to speak, different cultures and different way of doing things. But I think of the Northeast mainly when when it comes to Sasquatch in general, not to say that it it covers all, but just in general, um, the Native Americans of the Northeast, you know, such as the Mohawk and all this, they had certain areas that they would make the rounds and go to, but they would never make it a point to... um, cover each of these areas every year. You know, they would overlap them. One year they go, example, they go west uh, however many miles. Let's say, for example, uh, 25 miles, and they go to a certain spot that they have for the winter, and then they come back to a certain summer spot. Do you understand what I'm saying? And So they make their rounds in all these different spots in different, you know, so I guess you could say if they had five or six different spots, they would only hit one of those spots once every six years. Does that make sense? What, sure. what, what sure I'm saying. And, and, and I started Armando, thinking about that. Yes. Armando. Uh, yes. We have a question right now of time, and we'd like to get this question in. Oh, sure. From yes, the chat. It, do you mind us interrupting for just a moment? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no that's fine. Uh, uh, SOSBI from uh, the, the South. Oh, my goodness, Southeastern Ohio Sasquatch Bigfoot Investigations. Uh, They have a question for, I think it's Eric. Did you ever go Mm -hmm. to Shawnee State Forest in Ohio for investigating? Uh, Shawnee, yes. Yes. You've been to Shawnee? Okay. Yes, 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 I have. Uh, We were there uh, this this past summer. Uh, We went to Shawnee. Okay. All right. All right, we'll continue, guys. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, that's okay. And and just as I was saying, you know, that was the, uh, going back to, you know, that's the way the Native Americans conducted their, you know, uh, they they moved around all these spots. And and I think, in in my my hypothesis, is is that I think some Sasquatch do that, or they travel great distances and, 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 you know, cover areas and go to certain areas during certain times of the year maybe never hitting an area, you know, the same time the following year. Do you, see, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense what I'm saying? <laughs> I, that's that's my hypothesis on that. And then, of course, there's probably others that just that, that, that stay well within a short area, you know, because if they're human, going back to human, you know, going back to just the human element, you know, we can historically look back in our American history, whereas we had Native American tribes, that were nomadic, and then we had Native American tribes that were very much sedentary, such as, you know, you you had, like, for example, the Navajo Indians or the Pueblo Indian. A lot of them were very much, you know, uh, stuck, not stuck, but they were very happy staying in the same place, whereas if you look at the Plains uh, Indians, a lot of them were very happy just, you know, making the rounds, so to speak, you know, to all their areas that they had. So... You know, Sasquatch doing something of the same thing depending on their location. I, I you know, I would never, in my opinion, I, I would never put that out as, uh, you know, as it never being a possibility. I, I just, you know, I just, uh, I'll, I'll always preach the, uh, like I said, I'll always preach the human aspect of the Sasquatch. Not saying that they're nice, furry little creatures that'll never hurt a fly or anything. If they're human, that just means that they have their. They have their own personalities like we do. You can piss them off like, you know, we get pissed off, and you can do just about everything. You'll have those, you know, and you'll and I agree when Arla says, hey, they have personalities like we do. Some have want nothing to do with us, and others are curious, so just like a lot of us. You know, and, and like I said, I've never, had an, I've never had an encounter or anything like that. I hope that I do. I'll probably be scared to death like anybody, any normal person would. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's it's a bucket list. It's one of the things on the bucket list. 
Mm-hmm. Well, Armando, we thank you so much for calling. Well, okay. thank you for having me. I, I've, I will try to become uh, uh, a, you know, a regular again. Just everything okay. starting to settle down, and I'm, and I'm, and I've been meaning to get back on the show and and listen with you guys and talk to everyone else because uh, I, I think over the last three or four months we've made a lot of progress in, you know, people acknowledging that they are a uh, a, a human of some type, not okay. exactly like us, but a human. Well, All thank right. you so much. Thank you, Armando. Uh, thank you. Hey, Eric, thank you so much yeah. for calling in tonight. We really enjoyed um, a rehash of the story that you told before, but a little extra added. And anybody that wants to hear the entire interview with Eric, you can go to our archive. He was on, uh, were you on last week or the week before? Uh, week Any before friend? last. Yeah. Week before last, Okay. Anyway, it was a great show. If you want to catch that, just go to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio Archive, and you can find that. So thank you, Eric, so much for coming on. We have really enjoyed having you. Thanks for having you. me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay. And, uh, Grandmother, are you still with us? Well, I guess Grandmother is not with us. Okay. Uh, okay, how about Kenny? I'm still with you. Are you? I'm, well, I'm still with you, work. honey. <laughs> well, hey, we did really great, considering that it was a thrown-together show. I think it turned out real well. What do you guys yeah. think? Yeah. Oh, it was great. I didn't uh, get to hear Billy and uh, Grass cut up. So, yeah, that's that's okay, cause we were just having so much fun going through everybody's toys. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just chocolate chip cookies. That's what was going on over there. I know that. Yeah, I got my chocolate. Cookie. <laughs> uh, yeah, just uh, ignore me over here. I'm just chewing away. Don't mind me. Bill, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Well, you've been a rascal in chat. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do what I can. <laughs> I <know. laughs> oh my goodness! Well, guys, um, I want to let everyone know that next week we're having uh, let me see Brian Seach. And I'm trying to remember where Brian is from. He's our guest next week. So uh, I want everybody to turn, tune in on a Thursday night, eight o'clock Central, nine o'clock. Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time. We're not calling our states over video. We're going to go ahead and call it a night, y'all. What do you guys think? Y'all ready to say goodnight? Yeah, I think it's about that time. I'm just having fun yeah. meeting all these new people I've never heard of. <laughs> oh, we got a caller. <laughs> yeah, two minutes, yeah, two minutes to the end of the show. There's just enough time for the outro. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, caller, I'm sorry. We are we are fixing to sign off, and uh, hopefully, if you have a, a great story to tell us, please call in our next show. Well, they just went off. <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and call it a night. It was a great show. Thanks everybody for calling in and helping out, and uh, we're going to go ahead and roll that outro.